Hello and happy Sunday. And I thought uh, today I would show you some more of my favorite books and uh, show them to you and explain why I like them. So I hope you enjoy this video. Um, I thought I would just go counterclockwise around the loop. And uh, we'll start with this one. This old paperback is... Uh, the Man Who Saw Tomorrow, The Prophecies of Nostradamus. Um, this was turned into a uh, controversial motion picture by Warner Brothers. Um, it was narrated by Orson Welles. Now, the movie itself, um, I, I don't take it very seriously, and I don't think Orson Welles took it very seriously, because I'm, I'm not a believer in Nostradamus. But the movie was very creepy and very uh, unnerving. There was lots of nightmare fuel in it. Kind of in that same way that Unsolved Mysteries is, with creepy reenactments and creepy music with a very sober narrator, Orson Welles, with his very uh, dark and uh, his voice uh, made everything much scarier and the reenactments were all very chilling and grim. So it has that same Unsolved Mysteries effect. So if you're looking for Nightmare Fuel, I do recommend that movie. But let's go through some of these quatrains. And um, I'll tell you why I don't believe in Nostradamus very much. So each... So he wrote these four-line sort of story slash poems called quatrains. And he organized them in different chapters that he called centuries now he would uh he was a physician but in his spare time he would look into a bowl of water and a candle and he would supposedly see the future and write um a series of words sometimes in mix mixtures of latin and french um so for example we interpret um that quatrain 26 from century one is about the kennedy assassination so if we turn to that, um, it says, here it is in its original language, and it says, The great man will be struck down in the day by a thunderbolt, an evil deed foretold by the bearer of a petition. According to the prediction, another falls at nighttime, Conflict at Reim, London, and pestilence in Tuscany. So their ex exclamation here, or explanation is, the first three lines here may apply to the assassinations of the two Kennedy brothers. John F. Kennedy was shot down, uh, in parentheses they put Thunderbolt, um, in broad daylight at Dallas, Texas, on 22nd November 1963 by the psychopath Lee Harvey Oswald. The other man linked with him who is killed at night was his brother, Robert F. Kennedy, who was shot down on the 5th of June, 1968, in the early morning while celebrating his victory in the presidential primary elections at a hotel. Line, t line 2, the fact that the assassination had been told by the bearer of a petition may refer to the many death threats John F. Kennedy and his brother received during their terms of office. The troubles in France, England, and Italy would refer to the world repercussions to these assassinations. That's very vague. I'm not aware of any repercussions in France, Italy, uh, I, I, or uh, London, other than just reporting it on the news and um, sharing their, you know, sympathy. So I, I find that to be very vague. I don't agree that it foretold anything. Um... And then we have stuff about the Second World War, the Antichrists. Um, now, keep in mind, Nostradamus was in the 1500s. So he taught, he's, and a lot of his quatrains were interpreted to be about France. And naturally, but I, I don't think any of these are convincing. And I've read a lot of these quatrains. And I haven't been sold on Nostradamus. That's not saying I don't enjoy having the book and looking at it. And, you know, it's... I think I like the book more because of the movie. 
and but you know this is the source material for that movie that was um very creepy in that unsolved mysteries sort of way so but i still like the book this is a by incidentally if you're looking for a very well organized collection of nostradamus quatrains get this book there's all kinds of stuff out there and different translations and stuff and a lot of it's really silly but uh the next book i want to show you uh is also uh connected to a movie or in this case a really long netflix movie i enjoyed this movie very much the irishman um this is the book that i found for it this was originally called so i heard you paint houses um it was retitled the irishman i don't know why maybe they just thought that i heard you paint houses is either too grim or too vague but the book is and the movie are about the idea that frank sheehan i'm sorry frank sheeran um assassinated jimmy hoffa uh that this has been widely debunked um there's it's very unlikely that Frank Sheeran assassinated Jimmy Hoffa and it's almost completely fabricated. There's a scene in the movie where it shows Frank Sheeran assassinating Joey Gallo and that that also didn't happen. I think Frank, Frank Sheeran definitely worked for organized crime, but I don't think he did all of these things. Nonetheless, the movie is a lot of fun to watch. It's a great period piece. Um and it's it, you know I, I love seeing these actors together al pacino robert de niro and, and joe pesci along with harvey keitel and a lot of other great actors are in this movie so it i mean it's not but it's just not accurate these mob movies are not accurate like for example um this is like maybe the third in the trilogy starting with goodfellas then casino and then this movie well, Goodfellas was not accurate either. It was the the group of thugs they showed, the guys who pulled off the Lufthansa heist, were just hijackers. They were not part of the mafia. And Henry Hill would never have been able to go to the Copacabana and walk in through the kitchen like they showed and get a front row table. That was all fiction. Um, the way the the level that they showed him connected to the mafia is not very true. Casino was probably of the three movies the most accurate, but even that movie about Lefty Rosenthal and Tony Spilatro took a lot of liberties. It was about the Stardust Hotel, so, um, and they hinted that a lot, but a lot of that movie was also fiction. Uh, this movie was particularly fiction. Nonetheless, it was fun to watch. I don't think it was the best casting to put Al Pacino as Jimmy Hoffa, but I still enjoyed it. So that's the Irishman. And notice how paperbacks have gotten taller. See, they used to all be the same size. Anyway, this is also a book based on a, on a TV show. Um, this is The Blue and the Gray. And The Blue and the Gray was a miniseries made by um, CBS back in 1982. And it was based off a book called Reflections on the Civil War by Bruce Catton, who at that time was considered the greatest living Civil War author. And then he went to Shelby Foote and then James McPherson. So, but at the time, Bruce Catton was the authority on the Civil War. So Reflections on the Civil War was about, in addition to the war, it was about uh, a Union soldier named John Geyser who kept a sketchbook. Well, uh, and the sketchbook had a lot of poignant drawings of army life in it. Now, this miniseries took the character or took the real person of John Geyser and turned him into a southerner who becomes uh, an artist for Harper's Weekly. And his brothers are all in the Confederacy. He falls in love with the daughter of a uh, Union senator and his best friend is a Union officer. So... Uh, it, they added a lot of drama, but they used that to make it interesting to sort of round out the story 
as they tried to teach about the Civil War from it starts in 1859 and it goes all the way to 1865 and it tries to cover the most important incidents starting with John Brown all the way through the surrendered Appomattox and it tries to illustrate how it tore up the country and the country was sort of um the metaphor was this family the Hales and the Geysers they were cousins the Geysers being the southern ones and the Hales were the northern ones but um, the two sisters, you know, were the heads of the families and they married respectfully in North and South. So John is the person in the middle that we see the story from his point of view. He uh, is best friends with Jonas Steele, who is a sort of a um, predecessor or he kind of implied that he was kind of a Pinkerton type of character, but also like a Secret Service uh, agent. But he also holds a commission in the Union Army. He falls falls in love with uh, um, the daughter of a sinner. She's not even really in the book. The book doesn't have most of the movie in it because they couldn't put all of the eight hours of the movie into this book. So it just covers the high points. Gregory Peck plays Abraham Lincoln. He does a great job. Uh, Robert Vaughn is the senator. Um, Sterling Hayden is John Brown. Um it's it's really uh the uh, mini series is a lot of fun to watch they even made a school cut for it they call it the blue and the gray recut to be shown in schools where, where they cut out a lot of the best parts though but i have the uncut version which i highly recommend it's not that controversial because it was a 1982 tv movie it has a few adult elements to it but for the most part, it's pretty tame, and I think they could have shown the whole thing in schools as well. They definitely could nowadays. When I was in school, things were a lot different. The next uh, book also touches on the Civil War. This is Dances with the Wolves, the original story that inspired the movie. Um, there's a few differences between this book and the movie. Kevin Costner liked the book. He had helped adapt it, and he directed the movie. And uh, it was a epic story of a Union officer who goes out west because he wants to see it before it's gone. And he befriends a tribe of, um, I think they were Sioux or Cheyenne. Um, and he, they fight against the Pawnee and eventually U.S. Cavalry. And uh, he learns to appreciate them and they learn to appreciate him and... It's it's a good movie. Um, it's a dark movie. It's a violent movie. Um, but I enjoyed it. Uh, when it came out, I watched it several times. Um, I have the ultimate director's cut of this movie that has lots and lots of extra scenes. It's much, much longer. And interestingly, it has some of the same actors that were in The Blue and the Gray. In fact, one of the Geyser Brothers plays uh john dunbar's predecessor at the fort that he goes to so it's pretty cool um i really did like this and the book is much different like i'll give you one example but i don't want to give too many spoilers for example in the movie we see the um what is it captain or major at, at the fort in kansas i think it's fort hayes or uh where he gets his orders to go out to the remote port and then he is obviously mentally ill and he ends up taking his own life well in the book that doesn't happen he just sort of flips out and then they put him into a an institution so th there are a lot of changes made for dramatic effect but still i think there is it follows it to a pretty good extent okay um the next book is one that I really like from my childhood. This is the Jedi Master's Quiz Book. Now, when I was a kid in Chico, Texas, I cannot stress enough how there were not very many Star Wars related things to read compared to now. I mean, you barely have to turn around before you'll find 50 Star Wars themed books. But back then you had, in this year, at the time this book came out, you had the novel Star Wars, the novel for The Empire Strikes Back, 
You had a book called Splinter of the Mind's Eye. You had a couple books about Han Solo and a couple books about Lando Calrissian. And other than that, that was it. So if you wanted more Star Wars info, you didn't have a cell phone to turn to. You didn't have Wikipedia. You didn't have uh, streaming services to watch the movies. You didn't have DVDs. You didn't even really have VCRs that much back then. So this was a valuable book. We would check this book out repeatedly. I must have read it ten times. And it was all these trivia facts. And most of the stuff has held up pretty well. Most of these facts... You know, written in 1982, remain whether it's you know technical facts about the movie or facts about the Star Wars universe. I mean, some of them are not have been changed by canon, but the real interesting thing is this was written by an 11 year old kid named Rusty Miller. And as you can read about the author, Rusty Miller has red hair and lots of freckles, wears braces, and smiles a lot. He's an all American kid. See. This was a book written by a kid for kids, and he was older than me, because I checked this book out when I was six or seven. But this one I always read, and I always liked to read when I was taking a break from school. This is this was my go-to book. So, yeah, it's a little bit about my childhood. Okay, um, the next book... This is a good example of the kind of book I like to just flip through. This is Good Old Days, Live It Again, 1942, featuring the best of the Saturday Evening Post. And uh, it says, A sentimental journey into the past. Turn back the clock to 1942 and take a look at daily life through the eyes of a typical American family. The editors of Good Old Days magazine have teamed up with the Saturday Evening Post to bring you a captivating visual tour of American life in 1942. People and events that fascinated us, fashions and styles that defined our culture, music, sports, and movie stars we loved, advertisements that fueled hopes and dreams, cartoons that made us laugh, bits of trivia that trigger our deepest memories, and plus... Images from all of the 1942 covers of the Saturday Evening Post. So, and it's got a website. I don't know if it still exists. Um, so, it has a little intro and your table of contents. And then you just cut right into all of this stuff about life in 1942. You know, the, uh, the war was going on. Um... And we see life reflected through cartoons, the Saturday Evening Post drama stories, newspaper headlines. This is just kind of neat because it just shows a bygone time. It has a lot of, like, images of the time. So it gives you little newspaper headlines to sort of keep track of where you're at. So, and it also shows that 1942 wasn't just the war, but it was the kids at home, the wives who were working in the factories, the, um, how everyone was affected by what was happening. It changed everything. 1942 is a really good example because that was the beginning of the war for us. You know, it was declared December of 41. You look at that Whitman samples. They've never changed that box. Jimmy Stewart in the Air Force. Clark Gable was in the Air Force, or the Army Air Corps, as they called it. Bob Hope on the USO circuit. African Americans joining the military um, in the Marine Corps. They were. Um, the waves, the naval service, um, the wax, women's uh, army auxiliary corps, and commissioned officers, and it was you know a turning point. We had the Tuskegee Airmen. I actually got to meet one of the Tuskegee Airmen um, many years ago. Not many of them are still alive. Um, 
and I live right close to Tuskegee. So there's just a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, while I'm showing you this, I'll show you something else. This is an actual ration book. So back home on the home front, we had to ration everything because the war effort was paramount. So we had to ration meat, rubber, all that stuff. You And you had ration coupons to buy things. And they had pictures of tanks and stuff on it because that was to support the war effort. So yeah, we had to ration things back then. So anyway... Just there's Bean Cosby. Um, carpooling, you know, all of it was about conservation and rationing. Oh, I think they might have even shown a picture of a ration book in here. Uh, maybe well kind of, not exactly but um, the war bonds if you watch old World War II movies they would end with buy war bonds doesn't that look like the Incredibles the same style as the animation from the Incredibles Just really interesting and I'm a student of World War II and um, I find all of it very fascinating this whole time period no, but you're getting to see pretty much everything except the cigarette ads <laughs> people did smoke a lot back then and one of my favorite movies, Casablanca, right here. Um, oh, the big band music. Some of my favorite music. Benny Goodman, Jimmy Dorsey, Gene Krupa, Glenn Miller, um, Jack T. Garden, Tommy Dorsey. Yeah, a lot of my favorites. I'm a big Fred Waring fan, but he was a little bit earlier. Cedric Hardwick. And we go all the way to Christmas, 1942. We see every cover of the post, too, which is really cool. And then we got birthdays. See, these are people born in 1942. Uh, let's see if there's anyone he, still famous. Um, let's see. Uh, Scott Wilson from Walking Dead. Um, Barbara Streisand. David Proval, he was in The Sopranos. Um, Frank McRae, he was from uh, Batteries Not Included. Um, Richard Roundtree played Shaft. Chris Sarandon from Fright Night was born in 1942. I had no idea he was that old. Tony Sirico, he was in The Sopranos. Cat Isaac Hayes from South Park. Um... Earl Hinman, I think he was on Home Improvement. Bob Ross, of course, the painter. Um, Donna Mills. And then here's the facts and figures. Leatherheads, football players. So that's... 
That is Live It Again, 1942. Just a book I like to look at. Now, this book is two stories of the CSI, the real crimes behind the best episodes of the popular TV show. Um, are these just bizarre plot twists invented by a creative team of writers or genuine headline making news stories? In true stories of CSI, they're both. It is renowned forensic specialist Catherine, Ra Catherine Ramsland revisits some of the most absorbing episodes of the phenomenally popular CSI television franchise and explores the real-life crimes that inspired them. She also looks into the authenticity of the forensic investigations recreated for the show and the painstaking forensic process employed in every one of the actual cases. So if you're a fan of CSI, you might want to look for this book because it shows you the actual crimes that were used to inspire the show. And like, bite me. A woman dies at the bottom of a staircase and the shocking amount of blood contradicts her husband's claim that she had actually accidentally fallen. And then it has the true story, the, the death of Kathleen Peterson, which is one they talk about a lot on TV these days. Um, so you get this, you, you hear about the episode and then you, the Heaven's Gate call, for example, hear um, the Ch Charles Manson, um, The Vampire of Sacramento. Spontaneous human combustion. So there's a lot of true stories in here. And there's just tons. Lots of good reading. It's also quick reading. So if you don't have a lot of time to read. Like you want to get yourself tired for bed or whatever. This is the perfect book in my opinion. Read one of these short essays. You learn about a crime, you you compare it to the show you watched. It's, it's really interesting stuff. So, and you've got pictures. So, definitely, if you're a fan of the show and if you like to compare reality with fiction, pick this book up. This is True Stories of the CSI. Um, this is Morris, an intimate biography by Mary Daniels. And um, this book was given to me by Mary because when I was a kid, I had this book and it was my favorite book and I lost it. As a kid, I was a big fan of Morris the Cat who was the spokes cat from Nine Lives. I like to watch the commercials. And uh, so my parents had bought me this book a long time ago. And I really, I actually read the whole thing and learned about Morris. And he was in different movies. Like he was in a Burt Reynolds movie. He was kind of a famous cat. And um, he, I was a little kid, obviously. So... <laughs> Morris and his stunt doubles. And they see cats that look like Morris because they needed more cats. And, of course, the center photo of Morris the cat. So, just a silly book. Mary got it for me because I had lost it, and it was really nice to have it again. Uh, it's funny the things you really like when you're a kid. And when I was a kid, I really... When I was such a kid, I actually believed a lot of this stuff because it's like, you know, um, you know, you like silly things when you're a kid. And I definitely liked this, this cat. So <laughs> it's, it's, this is just one of the sillier favorite books I own, but I still like it. I take good care of it. Very, this is very special to me and it's a present from my wife. So of course I like it. Uh, the next book I want to show you is We Only Kill Each Other by Dean Jennings. Um, this was the book that was supposedly used as the inspiration for the movie Bugsy. And um, and it talks about the real Benjamin Siegel. 
and that's when he was young and it shows him with the different actors like George Raft and Clark Gable and everything well um the thing is is Bugsy also kind of like the Irishman and other things we've been talking about here was very very fictionalized oh my gosh it was so fictionalized um I don't even know where to begin I liked the movie a lot, and I have both versions, the director's cut and the original version. I like Warren Beatty, I, but there was nothing in that story that was realistic. For example, for one thing, um, he came to Los Angeles much earlier than what they showed. Um, he, he didn't really found name or establish the Flamingo. That was done uh, by another guy. Um, and... Uh, he, he, Benjamin just took over the funding of it. So that was pure Hollywood right there. Um, Las Vegas already had casinos. It wasn't like the first one. Um, he, Harry Greenberg, the scene where he dramatically shoots Harry Greenberg as his friend, that wasn't um, anything like reality. In fact, the movie Dragnet, the 1954 movie with Jack Webb, was about the murder of Harry Greenberg, and it was not done in a sad way. It was done in a cold-blooded, malicious way. And Harry Greenberg, Greenberg didn't have any dirt on Charlie Luciano or anything either. There wasn't anything like that going on. And Charlie Luciano, um, he was deported, as they show, he was deported to Italy, but it wasn't because Harry Greenberg testified against him. That was pure fiction. Um, Harry Greenberg wasn't high enough to have had any information about Charlie Luciano. Um, the whole, they didn't go into very many details about his relationship with Dorothy DeFrasso. She was just barely a cameo in the movie. Um, Virginia Hill and him, Virginia Hill was not the lady they made out in the movie. Virginia Hill was nothing like Annette Benning. Virginia Hill was from Alabama. She was a... She had a, she was a, kind of a squinty-eyed, sassy Southern girl. She was vulgar, and she had been with lots of gangsters. She was just a gangster's mole. Uh, nothing like Annette Benning, not a class act like they showed. So you could go, the list goes on and on and on. And all, overall, Ben Siegel was not. He wasn't like Warren Beatty that they showed. He was. Above all, he was a gangster. He was a scary guy. He was a violent-tempered guy. Uh, not, not. Um, they they touched on some things like this book talks about how he would try to read, you know, Reader's Digest. It pays to build your word power. He tried to improve himself a lot, but not because he wanted to improve himself as much as he wanted to hobnob with celebrities and so forth. People he he looked up to that he wanted to be like. Um, he, what, the way he was shot was not accurate. He was in the presence of Alan Smiley. His, uh, Virginia Hill's brother was in the house with another girl. There was other people present. He was reading a newspaper on the couch. He wasn't watching a film. Um, he was shot in quick succession, not, not, as they showed in the movie, you know, staggered, you know, with several seconds in between each shot. It's pretty much established that he was shot by a guy named Frankie Carbo, and it was probably under the orders of Meyer Lansky. And um, I don't think they decided to do that in Havana. Uh, that's according. That was from Charlie Luciano's book that they showed that. I don't believe that's the case, but it wasn't. He wasn't shown. They showed him to be killed because his hotel was a failure, and they hinted that there was money skimming going on, but. It's widely believed that there was the money skimming was much worse and that he was in on it. So nonetheless, this is the book that inspired it and it's much, much different than the movie. It uh is much more interesting than the movie. You should read it. He had a lot more relationships with celebrities than they went into. He and it, there was just some crazy stuff about him. Um The final book is a field guide to birds. Um, and, uh, this is for bird watching and we have a lot of birds around here 
and I want to take this whenever I go to Europe and look for birds. Um, but uh, I want to say Eastern Land and Water Birds. This may only be, though, for... Yeah, it's only American birds, but still... It's a bird identification book, and it has a lot of pictures. And my dream is to use this at some point. I've had this book for years, and I really want to go bird watching at some point and spot and record the birds I see. So that's been a dream of mine to do that at some point whenever I have the time. I would really like to do that someday. And use this book. That's a that is a dream of mine, is to actually go bird watching. So I have this book, and one of these days I want to go and see all these birds. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and please leave a comment, uh, thumbs up, subscribe, and click the bell icon. And until next time, bye.